Well, Jenny, thank you so much for that extremely kind and generous introduction. Uh, she didn't identify herself as my literary agent, but she is. So <laughs> you should bear that in mind. I need a <laughs> We'll talk about that later. <laughs> it's, uh, it's always an honor to be invited to speak to a group like yours. Uh, and it's a special honor to be invited back to speak to a group like yours. And it's a really, really, really special event to be invited twice back to speak. So <laughs> it's, it's my pleasure to be here for the third time. And I relish every opportunity I can get to speak about my favorite subject without having to grade any of your papers or exams. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Now, uh, I thought I might tell you a little bit about how this book came to be before we get into the substance of the talk. Uh, Back in 1994, I published my first book. It was called The Inner World of Abraham Lincoln. It's a series of psychological essays um, about his relations with his parents, uh, with his wife, with his children, his, his anger, his midlife crisis, his depressions, all that sort of thing. I wanted to call it Shrinkin' Lincoln, but uh, <laughs> my stuffy old publisher, the University of Illinois Press, wouldn't allow that. So anyhow, and in those nine chapters, the one that was longest and most controversial dealt with a marriage. And actually, when the book was published, it became an AP Weimer service story. I couldn't believe it. And it was on CBS Morning News and uh, uh, National News and all that. And, that. and it was because the marriage chapter contained some information that I had unearthed that had not been known before or hadn't been fully developed. Uh, and uh, one of those items was the fact that she engaged as first lady in all kinds of corrupt and unethical practices. She accepted bribes, she accepted kickbacks, she padded payrolls, she padded expense accounts, she sold cotton trading permits, she sold state secrets, she sold <laughs> access to pardons. It was just shocking. Um, and uh, so that was one thing. <laughs> and in 1994, there was a kind of parallel that you may occur to you, but, um, and uh, the second thing was that she physically abused her husband. Now, that may seem a little strange to you because, well, this, I, I should have presented a PowerPoint, but there's no image of Abraham Lincoln and Mary, no photograph, but there is this drawing that gives you some sense about how much he towered over her. Uh, this was a sketch from life uh, in 1864. But see how tall he is and how short she is? Now, it's one thing if I get up here and tell you he was 6'4 and she was 5'2, but when you see this image, <laughs> it really does drive home the great disparity in height between them. Uh, it's really extraordinary. Anyway, so how could a man 6'4 who was strong Lincoln was very physically strong. How could he be uh, abused, physically abused, by a woman five foot two? Um, well, the fact is he was, and we have testimony from various neighbors in particular, uh, law partners, um, associates in politics, about how she would drive him out of the house with, uh, with a knife, chase him out into the yard. Chase, chase him out, absolutely, uh, uh, this got good, very good evidence for this. Chase him out of the house uh, with a broom. Uh, chase him out of the house on one occasion throwing potatoes at him. Uh, <laughs> I'm not making this up. Uh, uh, that, uh, one day he brings home meat from the uh, butcher. He did the morning shopping. It, it was the wrong kind of breakfast meat. She smacked him in the face and drew blood. <laughs> and so he just went to his office that day. It's just, it's, it's just, it's unbelievable stuff. One day, uh, he's uh, sitting in a parlor in their house, and he has failed to stoke the fire. And Mrs. Lincoln says, I've told you three times now to stoke that fire, and you have ignored me, and I'm going to teach you to pay attention to me. And she picks up a piece of stove and hits him in the face. He shows up on the next day with a plaster, with a big band-aid on his, on his face. Uh, so, uh, and, and also, she struck her children. Uh, which wasn't entirely uncommon in those days, um, but she, she was pretty, could be pretty harsh. 
and she struck servants. <coughs> the servants in those days were oftentimes <coughs> young women from Ireland, and she referred to them as the wild Irish. And uh, in 1856, when Lincoln was working very hard to promote the first presidential candidate of the Republican Party, uh, John C. Fremont, he was giving 50 speeches all around the Midwest, mostly in, in Illinois, but also in Michigan and elsewhere. And he was knocking himself out to get the anti-slavery candidate elected. And it, it didn't work. Uh, uh, but it set the table for his own election four years later. And uh, his wife writes a letter to her favorite sister shortly after the election, uh, saying, well, my southern heart was uh, too devoted to the interests of the South to, to support any candidate uh, except Millard Fillmore. And Millard Fillmore was the candidate of the so-called American Party, the Know Nothing Party, which was devoted to the causes of anti-Catholicism and anti-immigration. Uh, and you think, good Lord. Um, so, uh, so anyhow, so, uh, the, uh, those those uh, two items made that, that essay uh, and that book quite well known. And I thought, I, I had not myself been <coughs> doing research all around the country. And I deduced a great deal of new information, uh, particularly about the marriage. And I footnote everything go fairly well. Now, this book doesn't have any footnotes in it because there are 150 pages of footnotes. <laughs> and I wanted to keep the book to a manageable size that might have a readership. Because my big Lincoln book is 2,000 pages. 2,000? Mm -hmm. Now, I've reduced it to pamphlet size, uh, and in October, a one volume abridgment will be available, and, and it's only 650 pages. So, <laughs> <laughs> a mere pamphlet, I might say. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, and so, in any event, um, so, I, so I thought, good. Now, not everybody would necessarily agree with my interpretation, my take on this information that I had painstakingly deduced, but I thought at least they would have to take it into account uh, when they dealt with the Lincoln marriage. Well, book after book about the Lincoln marriage or about um, Mrs. Lincoln, uh, biographies of her, will come out, and they, they pay no attention. And I thought, well, I thought I'm a little miffed about that. And then when I did the big 2,000-page book, I added a lot more information, but again, that didn't seem to have any effect. The, the books would continue to appear that ignored these aspects of Mrs. Lincoln's behavior that are pretty unsavory. And then I thought to myself, now Michael, please think about it. If you were a general reader and you wanted to know about the Lincoln marriage, would you go to a book with the rather vague title, The Inner World of Abraham Lincoln? Probably not. And would you go to a daunting, formidable 2,000-page biography? Probably not. So I thought, okay, what I, really, what I really want to get this story out there to a larger public, put it in the form of a book that's of reasonable length um, and with good pictures. Um, and, and it's amazing now, you can have color illustrations in books. That, in the old days, publishers would say, it's too expensive, forget about it. Uh, but now, it, it's, it's very cheap, and, and, there's some, and, and what has been done with 19th century photographs is to colorize them uh, in a sophisticated fashion. When colorization first came out, it was terrible. Uh, but in recent years, it's become so subtle and so sophisticated that it, it really, these images that the, the historians are familiar with look as though they come to life when they have these sophisticated, colorized versions. Okay, um, so that's how this book came to be. Now, uh, it starts off with an anecdote that uh, is one of my favorites. Uh, it's about Lincoln on what he called butcher days uh, in the White House when he would be asked to pass judgment on death sentences that courts martial had handed down for Union soldiers who had uh, deserted or had fallen asleep on sentry duty or what have you. And he famously bent over backwards to find extenuating circumstances to issue or commute, uh, commute those sentences uh, or issue an outright pardon. And one day he's dealing with the case of a young man 
who was condemned to death for deserting and going back to his hometown because he had heard a rumor that his sweetheart uh, was uh, making eyes at a rival. And so he wanted to nip that romance in the bud. And so he left his Union Army post, went back home, uh, intervened, married the young lady, and then was arrested for desertion. And Lincoln said, as he signed the pardon, he said, well, I think this young man really should be punished. Um, because after all, it's a serious business desertion. So he should be punished. And, uh, and maybe in about a year, he'll regret that I issued this part. So <laughs> that gives you some idea of what Lincoln thought about marriage. Holy, holy acrimony, <laughs> or holy deadlock, right? Um, so, uh, anyhow, so now, what my book is about is why Lincoln had cause to rue his marriage as much as he thought that that young soldier would rue his. Now, uh, for reasons that we outlined, the, the marriage was not a very successful one. Oh, it was very successful politically, obviously. Uh, but as a, uh, a union of two loving souls, it was not very successful. And, and why was that? Well, in part, it's for, for psychological reasons. Uh, I am, I am a psychohistorian. Uh, that, by the way, this is one word. <laughs> there are psychohistorians, two words. <laughs> but I, I flatter myself that I do not belong to that category, although not everybody I know would necessarily agree with that. But that's, that's neither here nor there. Um, so anyway, so um, in my reading of that marriage, uh, the, the, each of them was equally ill-equipped to, to be a good spouse to the other one. Now, Mary Lincoln, and, and, and a lot of what I'll be sharing with you in, in, in this talk is not very flattering information about Mary Lincoln. She behaved very badly, uh, not only corrupt, but uh, not only physically abusive, but uh, in general. And uh, in order to understand how it was that she wound up behaving that way, I think we need to understand uh, that she is more to be pitied than censured. Even though she grew up in a well-to-do household uh, with a prominent father who was a successful businessman and politician, um, she had a tough childhood. She referred in a letter to her childhood as desolate. And that's in part because when she was six years old, her mother died. And that's tough to lose a mother at any point in your youth, uh, it is tough, but particularly before you're, even before you're an adolescent, at six years old. Now, it is said that that is a very uh, fruitful source of depression in adulthood. That a lot of depression is, results from the early death of a parent. But that the damage done by an early death of a parent can be offset largely by a surviving parent who is emotionally available, supportive, nurturant, and the like. Uh, or a stepmother, uh, or a step parent to, to fill the shoes of the deceased parent might uh, help undo the damage that's done by that uh, difficult mourning. And, uh, but in, in her case, her father, uh, immediately the courts of another woman, much younger, and within uh, slightly more than a year, remarries. And, and you have to you feel for him too, because he's got all these other children. He sired 15 children, all told, and it's two marriages. Well, every man should have an occupation, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in any event, uh, uh, so, and then the stepmother doesn't like Mary and her siblings. Because she says to her husband, don't pay any attention to those six children you had by that dead lady. Pay attention to the nine children we're going to have. And that's just the standard brand blended family problems, which we tend to think are the product of modern divorce, but they're really the product of death 
that so frequently accompanied childbirth in those days. So in any event, so here's, here's Mary, six years old. She, and, and children tend to uh, interpret the early death of a parent as a deliberate act of abandonment. Well, that's crazy, but that's the way children think of her. So she feels abandoned by her mother. Then her father remarries this woman who says, don't pay any attention to Mary and, and her siblings. So she feels abandoned by her father, uh, not physically, but, but emotionally. Uh, and then the stepmother didn't like her. So that's a really tough combination of circumstances. And so I think what she did was to grow up with a resentment against her father for having remarried this unfriendly woman who didn't treat her very well. Uh, and she was mad at her father, but she, she couldn't express that anger in those days. So. And, and so what I'm trying to say is she deserves more to be pitied than censured. You got that? <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, uh, and then on top of that, she uh, has four children of her own. She and Lincoln have four children, all boys. Now that's a hardship for anyone, you know, to have no daughter. Um, and of those four, one survives to adulthood. Mm -hmm. And even by the standards of the 19th century, to lose 75%, three quarters of your children before they reach adulthood. That is tough. Uh, on top of that, she suffered from manic depression. All kinds of testimony we have from people who knew her when she was young said that she was either in the garret, that is the attic, or in the cellar. It was either um, manic or depressive by modern. Uh, definitions and, and no, nobody asks to inherit the manic depressive gene. That's tough. On top of that, she would get terrible migraine headaches regularly. It would induce nausea and, and uh, extreme pain. Um, she had she had problem, strong mental mental problems that, that we know about because of uh, neighbors. And all these things added up, you have to think, that's, every, the, the Almighty labels out a fair amount of misery on all of our plates. This just comes with it being human. But it seems to me that her portion was particularly heaping. Now, that by way of saying that she deserves more to be pitied than century, she did behave very badly, and she made her husband's domestic life very unpleasant. Now, Lincoln himself was no great shakes as a husband. Unlike every other man you've ever heard of, Abraham Lincoln was emotionally reserved and uncommunicative. Let me repeat that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and he especially so. And one of the reasons that he was so uh, uh, reserved was because his mother dies when he's nine. And, and dies under very painful, literally painful circumstances. She, she contracts a form of uh, tramadol poisoning from milk, from cows who ate poison weeds. Uh, and so, she's in a, so she dies in this one room cabin in front of her nine year old boy, 11 year old daughter in writhing pain for a week with her tongue turning red, thrashing around, moaning, and, and so it's just terrible to lose a parent at that age, and particularly to lose a parent under those circumstances. Now, her, uh, Lincoln's father was not emotionally available to him. Lincoln's father uh, and he were not at all close. In fact, when Lincoln's father lay dying, in his early 70s, in an Illinois town about 100 miles from Springfield. Lincoln receives a, a letter from his stepbrother saying, our father is dying and he would like to see you now. And Lincoln and his father had been pretty distant. And Lincoln writes back a letter we have in his own handwriting today, saying, tell our father that it would be more painful than pleasant if we were to see each other now. Whoa. No matter how estranged 
a child is from a parent. The imminence of death usually acts as a solvent on that estrangement, but not in Lincoln's case. And, uh, and Lincoln's father dies without having the comfort of knowing that his name would be carried on by a grandson. Mm -hmm. Now the fourth child, who's best known as Tad, was named Thomas after Lincoln's father. But Lincoln's father was dead before Tad arrived. So the first child comes along and is named after Mary's father, Robert. Then the second child comes along and is named after one of Lincoln's law partners. Third child comes along and is named after uh, Lincoln's uh, stepbrother, or half-brother. So, um, this, Lincoln and his father were clearly uh, estranged. And when Lincoln wrote about his father, he did so rather patronizingly. He said that his father was illiterate and only could, could only bunglingly, only bunglingly sign his own name. That's a pretty hostile word, bungling. And there's no evidence that Lincoln had uh, much affection for his father or his father for him. So uh, he had a really tough childhood. Now, how does that affect his marriage? Well, I think she, the death of his mother was interpreted by him, unconsciously, of course, as a, as a deliberate act of abandonment. And the lesson to be learned is you don't get close to a woman because she'll let you down. And so Lincoln had great trouble relating to women in general. He was always very awkward around women, uh, very bashful. Uh, and I think that uh, his uh, sense that you can't get too close, too close to a woman unless she abandon you made it uh, uh, difficult for him to relate to his wife as a husband should relate to a wife. And, and he was famous for staying away from home more than any other lawyer in central Illinois. In those days, you couldn't make enough money just staying in one town for the whole year. And every fall and every spring, you had to go out on the circuit, and you went from one, one uh, county seat to another to another. And he was the only one who, who went out on the circuit on day one, stayed on the circuit till the end, and never went home on weekends. Everybody else went home on weekends, uh, but not me. And what does that do to Mary? That, that's like putting kerosene on the fire. If she felt abandoned by her husband, I mean, that is by her father, and now her husband's absent so long, just, just uh, a rankled. And that, that made her very angry at it. And that angry, uh, but, but that anger actually manifests itself even before Lincoln becomes a lawyer. That is because it goes out on the circuit regularly. Um, when they got married, they moved in a, into a boarding house. And one of the rules of the boarding house is that no one could sit down and breakfast until everybody was at table. Mm -hmm. And Mary Lincoln was always a lame. So everybody else was st standing around, tapping their toes, looking at their watches. Um, and one day Lincoln chides her for her tardiness and holding up the days of all the rest of the orders. And she flies into a rage. She grabs a cup of coffee off the tray and flings it into his face and goes screaming. Out of, the, out of the room. Well, that gives Lincoln a foretaste, as it were, uh, of what was in store for him. Physical abuse, uh, temper tantrums, rage attacks. And, and his response is just to stay away as much as possible. So, so it, was, it, it was a bad marriage because of this the peculiar psychological backgrounds of each of them. Not, it's not to say that they were bad people individually, but that, that was a bad marriage because of these complications. So, um, now, why do we pay attention to the Lincoln marriage? Why do people just say, well, so what? Isn't that just sort of people magazine gossip? Who cares? Well, the, the marriage of Lincoln to Mary Todd was important because, for a number of reasons. First, he probably wouldn't have been president if he hadn't been married to her. And why is that? Well, because she was extremely ambitious. She had a, a, a she apparently told her childhood friend she was going to marry a president. 
And it, 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 it's to her credit that she recognized that this rather awkward six foot four lawyer in Springfield had that potential. Um, and so she was extremely ambitious. And Lincoln was ambitious too. But his ambition wasn't nearly as intense as hers. Uh, his law partner famously wrote in a biography of Lincoln saying, his ambition was a little engine that knew no rest. Well, there was a lot of truth in that. And what she did was to turbocharge <laughs> that engine. Second, she made life so disagreeable at home that he went out and politicked as much as he could, what we would in modern times call networking. Uh, giving talks, uh, uh, hobnobbing with uh, political allies, attending caucuses and the like, and just staying away from home as much as he could. And thereby, he, his network of political friends and friends in general became very large in central Illinois, which was extremely important for his political career. Uh, and if his home life had been much more agreeable, if he had married Ann Rutledge, his sweetheart in his early adulthood, who died tragically early on, um, that uh, things might have been very different. And finally, it's important to understand the marriage because Lincoln was, was successful as a president to a remarkable degree because of his uncanny ability to deal with difficult people. When you look at the generals like George McClellan that he had to deal with, or the politicians like Charles Sumner, or the editors like Horace Greeley, uh, or the uh, cabinet members like Sam and Chase and William Seward, these are all very difficult, assertive, <laughs> and egotistical, and some of them very capable people. Uh, and he had the extraordinary tact to deal with them all and to take no criticism, no mistreatment, nothing personal. He refused to personalize disagreements on politics, appointments, military strategy, what have you. Uh, and, and he would listen and he would uh, put up with uh, strong dissent, and even with rude behavior, George McClellan used to snub him regularly. Lincoln would go across the street from the White House to McClellan's home, uh, and this was really important, to consult with him, and McClellan would come back and walk past and go to bed, um, and send the servant down to say he was tired, you know, things like that. Uh, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, and if Lincoln had been like a normal uh, politician that is hypersensitive, uh, that uh, it said that, um, that there are two uh, realms in which people are, are uh, hypersensitive to slights and, and hyper uh, desirous of applause. And, and that's people in show business and people in politics. Uh, and some people call politics show business for ugly people. Okay. <laughs> uh, in any event, uh, so, so the, and this remarkable talent. For, for getting people to cooperate with each other, not feuding with them, not taking criticism personally, not taking mistreatment personally, enabled him to keep the Republican Party united, and by extension, the North united, and by extension, the country united. Because if Lincoln had failed, the country would have divided, and it would divide it again, and we would probably be dealing with the Independent Republic of East Ham, the Independent Republic of Sandwich, the Independent Republic of Ipswich, you know, right? Um, uh, and it would have been a great tragedy for the world as well as for the American people. And it's been said that if a man like Abraham Lincoln had been president of the South, and a man like Jefferson Davis, had been president of the North, and he was very touchy about his honor and taking offense and, and the like. Uh, but it's entirely possible that the South would have won the Civil War. Quote, I can't prove that, but it seems to me like plausible speculation. Mm. Let me close uh, this formal presentation. I'm going to be happy to field questions and response to, to respond to comments. Um, by uh, talking about Mrs. Lincoln's 
role in the assassination, or associated with the assassination. In the weeks just before that unhappy day in April of 1865, that unfortunate event at Ford's Theater, Mrs. Lincoln behaved extremely badly to Mrs. Grant. Lincoln had gone down at the end of March of 65 at Grant's request, uh, first of all to get away from Washington and all the pressure that he faced daily from office seekers uh, and people seeking promotions and contracts and so forth. Um, and, and the war was obviously drawing to a close. Um, and so Lincoln accepts Grant's invitation, and he and Mrs. Lincoln go down with Tad, um, their, their son. Um, and uh, so they stay there for several days. And during those several days, Mrs. Lincoln treats Mrs. Grant with great haughtiness and contempt. Mm -hmm. When they first get together, Mrs. Lincoln sits down, and Mrs. Grant then sits down next to her. Mrs. Lincoln says, how dare you sit down in my presence before I invite you to do so? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, there's an anecdote that speaks volumes, right? Mm -hmm. And so Mrs. Grant is really pretty uh, 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 eager to avoid contact with Mary Lincoln. They come back to Washington, and on the night of uh, April 13th, um, Lincoln, uh, has been invited to go out uh, on a carriage ride with uh, Mrs. Lincoln to see the illuminations. That is, the, the, this is a few days after Robert E. Lee surrenders. The city is just going berserk and joy, with joy and bursting with, with uh, bonhomie. And there are elaborate illuminations. Every building, every, has a, every window has a candle in front of it. And there are gas fixtures that, that spell out um, patriotic uh, uh, slogans and uh, so so those illuminations were regarded as really something special like the, like the Fourth of July fireworks at the, at the mall uh, and so so Lincoln had agreed to go on a carriage ride with his wife to view the illuminations but Lincoln was really pressed he had a lot of business and so um, so he asked Grant if he would pinch hit would you accompany Mrs. Lincoln in this carriage ride? And Grant, a very accommodating fellow, says, yes, I'd be happy to do that. So the, the First Lady and the General in Chief of the Union Armies gets into the, uh, the, into the carriage, and a crowd outside the White House gate sees them, and they start cheering for Grant. And Mrs. Lincoln gets all huffy at him, so they leave the carriage. Uh, and, and then they start cheering for her, for her husband, too. And then she gets back in. Well, this happens again and again and again. Mm. And every time she's about to get out, Grant has to encourage her to stay put. Uh, and so the next day, April 14th, 1865, Lincoln is supposed to go to the theater, the Ford's Theater, to see our American cousin with Grant. Now, Grant had gone, his shadow, the kind of personal bodyguard, you know, would have accompanied him. Uh, and Grant had strong military instincts. He, he would have not been unaware of, of a threat like the post by Booth. Um, but it wasn't. But Grant wasn't there because Mrs. Grant said, "There's no way, <laughs> honey. We're going to visit our children in New Jersey that day." <laughs> <laughs> and so the uh, security detail that accompanied the Lincoln, the coming of the Lincolns to Fort Theater, was far inferior to what it would have been if Grant had gone. Now, Mrs. Lincoln obviously didn't plot and plan that, but that, that's an indirect result of her very difficult personality. So, um, so the, uh, the, the story of, of uh, Lincoln's uh, marriage has more than just, just uh, gossip value, although it has that too, to be sure. Um, <laughs> and um, I'd be happy to answer any questions or to respond to any comments. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. How did two such different people get together? Get together in the first place. That's a good point. When Lincoln, when Lincoln moves to Springfield uh, as a young lawyer, uh, 
Uh, he had grown up in, uh, in Kentucky and then Indiana, and then one year in Illinois, and then he spends five years in New Salem, central Illinois, and, and is an autodidact. He teaches himself the law. And in those days, you didn't have to go to law school. You, you, got, you, you could read the books and then take an exam, an oral exam, and you could be admitted to the bar. And Lincoln was freshly admitted to the bar in 1837, so he moves to Springfield. Uh, and then uh, he, he stays at, uh, with a bunkmate um, who's from Kentucky and who, who operates a store. Uh, and that fellow is, is well connected with the Springfield aristocracy, the, the, the leading people in town. And so he goes to the, to the uh, home of the governor's son regularly for parties, and he, and he brings Lincoln along. Um, and so uh, he meets Mary at that, at, at that house where she's staying. She's staying with her sister and brother-in-law. She, she can't stay in her, her stepmother, so she moves to Springfield to stay with her sister. Um, so she's at these parties, and Lincoln shows up because of his, his uh, associate. Um, and they, uh, they meet, and he is taken with her wit and her education. She was highly educated for, for a woman of that era. She had gone to, uh, she had had 12 years of formal education. She spoke French. Uh, she had studied not just literature and mathematics, but she'd studied letter writing and ballroom dancing and all kinds of social graces as well. Um, and she was a, a witty conversationalist. And, um, and so Lincoln was quite drawn to her. Part, and on top of that, she knew Henry Clay. Henry Clay was a very prominent uh, Whig politician, and Lincoln admired Henry Clay vastly. So to talk to a woman who knew Henry Clay, who, whose father had been friendly with Henry Clay, that was an attraction. So, so they meet in late 1839, and they court, we don't know much about that, into 1840, and then they're apart for several months. She goes off to visit friends and, and relatives in Missouri. He is then campaigning for the uh, presidential uh, candidates of the Whig Party, William Henry Harrison. Uh, so they're, they're apart for a long time, and then they get back together in the latter part of 1840. Um, and by that time, Lincoln has a chance to think it over. <laughs> and then he realizes that for all of her attractiveness, she has a temper, that, uh, she's very sarcastic, um, and uh, he thinks it's not going to work out. So he breaks the engagement. They're, they're apparently not engaged. There's no formal engagement with a party and a ring and all that, but apparently they, they, there was an understanding. Uh, and then he breaks it uh, at the, on the first day of January, 1941. And she's, she's very distraught. Um, and then he's very guilty. Uh, he has a strong sense of, he has a strong conscience and a strong sense of uh, honoring his word. That it was, he, and he felt terrible that he had promised to do something and then he backed up. Uh, Intuition. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so, so uh, when it was made clear that she was still eager to, to wed him, um, that uh, he he had a sense of personal honor, to, so that for his own self-respect, would follow through on this promise. Um, and, and also, but by the way, when he breaks the engagement, he had also, at the age of 31, fallen head over heels with a beautiful 18-year-old Belle. So. <laughs> but he was too shy to even talk to her. But he felt, I mean, with my heart belongs to this gal. Could huh? you see a bit of Oscars? <laughs> could, could be. Could be. There, there are some uh, speculation. There is some speculation to that effect. I mean, and that's not like that. Right, exactly. It helps explain things, right? Yeah, okay. Um, so anyhow, so... So they get married, uh, and partly because I think she seduced him and said, you've got to marry me to protect my honor. Mm. Now, we can't prove that, um, but if you accept that hypothesis, which was not invented by me, it was another historian, actually a historian of Lincoln's religion of all things, um, if you accept that seduction hypothesis, um, it helps explain certain things. Lincoln told his best man, one of his two groomsmen, that he didn't love her enough to marry her. That he felt as though he were driven into the marriage. Um, the child, their first child was born eight months, three weeks, and four days after the wedding. Now that doesn't in and of itself prove anything, but it's suggestive in light of all this other evidence. Um, when asked where he was going on his wedding day, 
You said the hell I did. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they got married on one day's notice. Now, Mary Todd was, was, a, was a Springfield belle. And one of the things that the aristocracy of Springfield prided themselves on was giving elaborate weddings for uh, their, for their uh, sons and daughters. Uh, and she was <laughs> and Mrs. Lincoln, uh, Mrs. Lincoln's sister, um, Aunt Elizabeth, with whom she lived, the eldest sister, had a, had a big wedding for F Francis a couple of years earlier, another sister, and so it was just assumed there'd be a big fancy wedding for, uh, for Mary as well, but there wasn't. Um, uh, so if you, if you add all those things up, it seems plausible. And now, should we, should, should, would she have done something so unethical as that? Well, we know as first lady, she had a payroll, she had an expense account, she's getting all those unethical. Yeah. Uh, also, she was within a, a few weeks of her 24th birthday. And in Illinois, at that time, that was official old maidhood. If you got to be uh, so, so it all, it all seems to make sense um, that, that that hypothesis is, is valid. And, and it, 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 haven't you seen the movie Lincoln? Uh, it was a few years ago. You uh, consulted uh, on that. Uh, Steven, Steven Spielberg. Um, uh, as, 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 as Jenny was saying, I, I was consulted on that. There were about 15 of us who were gathered by Spielberg in, the, in New York at a hotel. And for a whole day, we talked about Lincoln and the possible script ideas and all that. And, uh, and I think I actually contributed one thing of, uh, that I can really point to. And that is, Spielberg asked you, he says, how can I show the horrors of war without having an elaborate battle scene like the one that begins saving Private Ryan? And of course, there is a little battle scene that begins Lincoln. But, but um, I said, well, to my way of thinking, the most vivid image I have of the horrors of the war is the image we have, images we have of houses in Gettysburg after the battle. Because every house became a hospital. Mm -hmm. And outside the windows of every house there grew a great pile of severed arms and legs. Oh and you may recall in the movie, Robert uh, sees a cart full of uh, these legs, and they're all dumped into it into a pit. I think I can take credit for that. But then, I think I can take credit for something else that I didn't even talk about that day. Um, and that is, you may recall in the movie, Mr. and Mrs. Lincoln have a dispute, a rather heated argument, about whether or not Robert should go into the army. Uh, and Lincoln was saying yes, and, and Robert was, was, was in college, uh, but he wanted to join the army, and his mother said no. Um, and, and Lincoln, to please his wife, said, well, okay. But then tried to convince her, look, sweetheart. And she says, you know, we've already lost two sons. If I lost another, I don't think I could retain my sanity. And Lincoln was genuinely worried about her sanity because she did teeter on the verge of, of mental breakdowns. Um, and uh, so, so they have this argument. And, and Mrs. Lincoln in the movie, says, you think I trapped you into the marriage, and you think Robert was the uh, result of that entrapment, and you've never liked him. And I thought, well, for heaven's sakes, Tony Kushner must have read my book. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so it's a very long answer to a short question. <laughs> Any other comments, questions? OK. Well, you're a very gracious audience to come out on a night like this, and I appreciate your attendance and your attention. So great.